Welcome to Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. Here's your host, Stacy Jones. I'm delighted to be here today with you all. I want to give a very warm welcome to Vachi Arabian, who is joining us from Portland, Oregon area on behalf of FLIR Systems to speak about their product placement program. For a little background, FLIR is the world leader in the design, manufacture, and marketing of thermal imaging infrared cameras, offering a wide range of products tailored to government and defense, public safety and transportation, security, industrial applications, professional tools, marine, home, and outdoor. Product lines that range from hundreds to millions of dollars. Vachi has been with FLIR for the last 11 years and is currently their senior manager of strategic communications, where he specializes in social brand strategy, content creation, community management, and channel development. He's made some major growth happen with FLIR social audiences, driving follower and engagement by over 300%, and growing their video content organic watch time by 178%. And his work at FLIR has led him to be recognized by Oregon Business and placed on their list of social media superstars. Bache also has a love of the entertainment industry in general, and is the founder and editor of TheLonelyReviewer.com, a very successful entertainment review blog covering new and previously released films and TV shows. But the real reason I've brought him on to our Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them podcast today is that Vashi manages Flair's branded content and product placement strategy, working with influencers, media, and film and TV content producers to incorporate Flair products and messaging. And we are the lucky agency to get to work with him, as he's our current primary client point for Flair's product placement program, which Hollywood Branded has been building and working on with Flair now for going on six years. Vache is the guy who gets to deal with the mayhem of last minute production needs, logistics of coordinating a team of FLIR engineers and cameramen to different shoots, and the one who gets to figure out how to share all the fantastic product placement exposure wins with both his coworkers and team at FLIR, as well as with FLIR's core business and consumer markets around the world. I wanted Vache to join our Marketing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them podcast today to specifically talk about FLIR's powerhouse of a product placement program and glean some additional information on what his advice is for companies and brand managers who are interested in leveraging this fantastic marketing practice for their own brands. Vache and his team have been incredibly instrumental in obtaining the product placement exposure the brands received, and there's a lot involved to not only crafting such a program, but also keeping internal teams motivated and in the loop of what the benefits are and getting enough inventory available to make a product placement program successful. We'll learn today what has worked, what maybe could be avoided if you're doing this yourself, and where other brands are missing the mark in this awesome world of entertainment marketing we all live in. Vache, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You are very welcome. So happy to have you here today. So you've been working in and then overseeing the product placement program at FLIR for the last several years, and it's a job that really actually, to me, seems custom made for you based on your love of the entertainment industry. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background, how long you've been at FLIR, and how you transitioned over and became involved with product placement specifically? Yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, like you said, I, I do feel strangely uh, built for, for doing this uh, for FLIR. So you know, my background is actually film production. Um, I went to school for it. I actually worked um, in the industry very early on in my career, um, you know, starting right in the trenches as a PA. Um, I, my first uh, job right out of college was actually working on The Departed in Boston, Massachusetts. So it was really amazing exposure. And I kind of got a look into that fast paced production world, um, you know, and, but my training was a, a, of a filmmaker and I wanted to, to kind of do that on my own. And um, I moved into doing uh, corporate video production um, actually for a, a company that we ended up per, uh, acquiring a couple years later. Um, and from then on, I kind of was the go-to uh, whenever uh, these opportunities popped up piecemeal of, of having to run some of our thermal cameras uh, in, in actually in more news uh, back, back in those days. The news would want to want to tell, do some storytelling with a thermal camera. And I was able to speak the language and I kind of understood what they were going for. Um, and as, as our, as the, as FLIR grew and, and our goals, kind of change that um, we wanted to get even more exposure. Um, you know, I think that was when we entered in a relationship with you guys, because we, we were getting a lot of these requests. And um, part of it was, uh, it's kind of tough uh, when you're getting hit and bombarded with these requests of you know, who to go for, who to not go for, and then really how to negotiate, um, you know, uh, uh, expanding that opportunity. Anyway, so um, I sort of got involved because I was able to speak both those both those languages, the production language and and the FLIR language, you know, the technical side. Um, so I've been doing that ever since. 
Well, that is a really specific language to be able to speak. And it's something that our team tries to do, but it's, it's like its own language within languages to be able to explain <laughs> production and corporate and, and build that bridge so that all can meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it, you know, our technology is um, pretty complicated. There's a lot of different options. A lot of times these productions will, will come to you guys with, you know, wanting to achieve something, uh, but not fully understanding um, either the com complexity of achieving that or even how to achieve that. And I think that's where you guys loop me in and then we have a discussion on, all right, they asked for this, but really this works out a lot better to, to do what they're trying to do, you know, um, that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. Each, each opportunity is its own puzzle. And then there's the little movie magic that sometimes happens, you know, behind the scenes where reality is a little fictionalized in some instances. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's very true. Um, yeah, we've definitely had, you know, there's a lot of mis misconceptions of our technology um, in, you know, because of, because of that movie magic. And um, sometimes explaining that to people is pretty funny uh, because, you know, oh, I thought I could see through walls. Well, I can't technically see true walls. So, uh, yeah, that, that happens all the time. <laughs> well, what are some of the biggest successes you've seen in the years since you began working with FLIR for your product placement initiatives in general? Um, I think um, it's funny because it's some of the stuff that comes out of left field that you're not, you know, because there'd be times where, you know, we're sort of chugging along and we get all these requests and there's, it's, I think the crazy last minute ones end up always being the the most uh, like I think the ones that we seem to get the biggest lift out of for for example um, when uh, Jared Leto approached us with 30 seconds to Mars because they wanted to do their entire VMA's performance in 2017 with uh, with thermal cameras I mean we we had a, like maybe a week and a half notice for that one um, and and then you know that in itself with uh, trying to realize what they were trying to do, um, you know, and, and find the best way to do that uh, with that amount of time um, was, was terrifying. And, but then the end result was, was amazing. You know, we got, um, we, I think that that was one of the biggest successes. I think the Sicario 2 integration we did um, was really interesting. And that was a, that was a movie that, um, you know, I think that was like three years ago. It just came out this year um, where there was a lot of negotiating back and forth it was the biggest ask, I think, or one of the bigger, biggest asks we've, we'd had where we actually installed one of our gimbal cameras into their, into their helicopter. Um, so it was used on screen and it was used as a functional camera to, to capture imagery. Um, that was really amazing. I mean, we, we had to sort of move mountains to get to just even do that one. And I think the payoff was amazing. I mean, the whole movie opens with, with uh, our camera and our name out there. Um, and I, we had a great behind the scenes piece come out of that too. I think that was a really good recent success. Rampage as well. That was another first where we actually flew. Um, we, we have a helicopter that we use for demos, um, and we actually flew that down and um, and shot with our gimbal camera um, for for a big sequence in that film. So th there's been some really, really. I think there's those three in the last um, year and a half have been the absolute biggest. I, I feel like every year we get something. We, we think, oh no, it's not. That's we peak. It's not going to get cooler than that. And then something comes up, and um, and or someone comes to us wanting to do something uh, really unique that we hadn't seen before. Uh, and and it pushes us out of our comfort zone sometimes too. Um, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think also with each success, it gives demonstrable material to be able to show to other producers and directors of what the potentials of working with Flair are, and so they're willing and interested in taking it the next level because you guys have invested so much time energy into working with Hollywood and so the wins mm -hmm. keep on coming because then your name has become even more familiar to those key decision makers mm -hmm. and the technology and the cool things that can be done are becoming more familiarized as well definitely definitely I mean it's it, um, I think it's it, 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 we're all uh, the funny thing too um, is we're we're open to kind of up and coming filmmakers too. Like once in a while, we'll get a request for, uh, from some um, you know small team or small group that really has their act together. Um, and and this was kind of uh, a really good example of this was working with Ryan Stack, um, who's a music video director, mm -hmm. 
Um, his music video is one of the one of the most viewed pieces of thermal content that are that's on the internet. It was for the the song My Love, and he was kind of an up and coming act that hadn't didn't really have a whole lot under his belt. Reached out to us. I think that came through directly, and um, you know he was sort of moving around in the dark, not knowing what what he'd be able to get, and we accommodated. We accommodated and got him the gear, gave him a little bit of support, and boom, like turned around to be an amazing music video. Now that guy's like, he's he's working, like he just did a video for um, Charlie XCX and yeah. like all these really big acts, and he's and someone we still have a good relationship with. You know, that, that kind of stuff happens too, and you can't really plan on that. No. So it's really interesting. And he loved working with you guys so much that when we had the opportunity to share a piece with the Directors Guild, during an event they were holding, he actually recorded um, footage and gave a testimonial and talked about how he utilized Fleer within that mu- uh, music video, which is really cool to be able to yeah. have. Yeah, it's it's amazing. You never know, like any of these requests, like you never know where it's going to go. And yeah. I don't think anyone would have guessed, um, you know, where that was going to go. So it was really awesome to see. Beyond the most exciting projects, what have been some of the larger challenges? And I'm assuming that often has to be with determining how to actually get a gimbal with the camera strapped on (laughs) to the belly of a helicopter during production. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, But other challenges as well. What have you been facing with product placement with that? You know, I think there's a couple challenges. I think, you know, a lot of folks will approach us and I'm still surprised with the amount of information that's out there on our technology when, when we tell them, some of the resolutions of the cameras that are available. Like people are still shocked. Like, wait a minute, the camera that goes on the gimbal is only 640 by 480 resolution. I mean, that that's actually, I think up to three, four years ago, a camera that small, that high resolution is, um, was the highest resolution, one of the highest resolution cameras in like at all. It's only recently where we're getting down to some uncooled smaller sizes that are nearly HD resolution. Sure. So that cut like the, ed- the education side for us is I think a challenge that um, because oftentimes when they're trying to integrate, it's, it's usually to film something. So ha- being able to get them to understand and then be on board. Cause a lot of these folks are, are pure, you know, shooting 4k, they're shooting 6k, they're shooting 8k. And then they go, Whoa, your resolution is 640 by 480. Like that's lower than, NTSC resolution. So that's kind of a challenge and explaining to them that this is like, if you want to achieve that, you know, that is, that is what they are. Um, you know, then, uh, like the, that, that sort of, it starts there. Then depending on what they're trying to do, like there's a really good example of a challenge, you know, we had with, um, with some of the stuff we did with, with, um, the 30 seconds to Mars where, they were having trouble because they, they had this vision of they wanted a chorus behind the performers. But the problem was the performers like have like collectively were because it was a, this big mass of people behind the artists. Um, it was kind of blowing out the image. The image looked like just filled with people. How do you make, you know, Jared, the lead singer stand out? Well, they came up with a clever solution of covering everyone with sheer plastic um, kind of head covers. So kind of, knocked down how hot they were in the background and then they actually uh sewed in flaxseed into the vest that he was wearing and microwaved it before production and that's what he's actually wearing uh which is hilarious because you know he's you know when you hear what it actually is it's kind of funny but in the image he pops because he's he's just lit up by by the thing you don't really understand why or how and that was something we had to figure out you know i think the day before we we finally figured out that um how to do it but you know so there's challenges like that you know and then there's other challenges too like sometimes like uh, with the gimbal camera um you know it, the gimbal camera is limited as far as color palettes go and if a filmmaker wanted to use um you know a particular colored palette um it's not really available on those cameras so sometimes the filmmakers have to make concessions because of the technology um so that's happened before as well And again, it's just education, you know, people understanding what it's capable of. Sure. Well, how big is your team in-house to support this program? So your Clear Systems is gigantic. I mean, you guys are a humongous company, but as far as your marketing team and your product placement team and those who work on influencers, how many of them are there? Um, I would say three, three or four. Uh, yeah, we're pretty small. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we, we definitely, we kind of wear a lot of hats as a team and, 
you know, while I sort of have, I'm the kind of point of contact, we definitely have the help of everyone that's on the communications team to, to get product, you know, where it needs to go and, and also coordinate with, um, with some of the specific product verticals to get, to get gear. Um, you know, some of that is also convincing people that, Hey, the sales asset, uh, we really need it, uh, because this is a really, really good opportunity. Um, kind of like Ozark, actually, that was a really good example of something like that, where, um, we kind of yeah. moved out. That was another one. We moved out to, to get a demo unit out. Um, and, it, and that ended up being like probably the best mention in any program that we've ever had. It was like a complete plot line around the clear what? camera. Yeah. Um, Ozark was yeah, a so, second storyline where you had two yeah. characters who were challenged by a third to go steal uh, one of the FLIR units on a boat and off they trekked for the entire episode on their mission to do so. Which yeah. was and that one was, yeah, it was challenging too, just given, given that that was the plot. Um, you know, there were some concerns, like, do we really want our product to be something that people steal? And like, so, so talking about talking that out and, and then getting the sales team on board to actually build a dummy unit, because that, that was a dummy unit, but you know, it still had to be assembled so taking time off of, you know, doing something else to do that. Like, so there's those kind of challenges um, as well. Uh, but, you know, so everyone kind of gets together and uh, pulls whatever strings they can, you know, on the communications team, um, outside of the communications team as well, just to make some of these happen. Because um, these aren't like, these aren't mass, not, I would say none of our products are mass produced products. Like they're, they're all kind of built, built as they're needed. Um, it's not like we have those maritime units like hundreds of them sitting on a shelf. Uh, so, and then the assets that we have are typically used for demo. So it's like being able to um, allocate that stuff quickly because, you know, uh, sometimes Hollywood moves faster than, than you can, than we can. <laughs> uh, but we've, I think we've pulled it together. We, I don't think we've missed very many opportunities, which is, which speaks volumes about the personalities that we I would say. No, your team's fantastic. Y'all really do jump through a lot of hoops in order to make things happen. <laughs> and now that we've talked about size and the fact that you have three or four people on your entire communications team doing, you know, not just product placement, but all of your marketing mm -hmm. initiatives. <laughs> but why does a company like Clear need a product placement agency like Hollywood branded versus a do it all yourself in house plan? I think, um, you know, executing on this stuff is really challenging. I think it allows us to scale, um, you know, when we like, because before, because, you know, with, with any of our products, we, we do things like bailment agreements. We, we have to track the ROI on stuff. We have to track if, uh, if, the, if the placement, act, you know, if it happens the way that they said it was going to happen, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's time consuming. And, and unfortunately, like we, um, our communications team is, is like, I'm, I'm in charge of social media for FLIR as well. Um, you know, I produce a lot of content internally that we're making. You know, we've got uh, folks that are uh, PR coordinators, PR managers that are um, pitching press and, and going to meetings about product line. You know, we've got all this stuff going on. So then adding, adding product placement on, and tracking and execution, all that on top of that is it, really hard. So we're able to, to kind of shift that and really lean on Hollywood branded to, um, to, to really own, own the, the back and forth. Cause you know, anytime like I've counted some of the emails on the ones that like we hadn't kicked over to, to Hollywood branded and it'll be like 45 emails back and forth. And uh, cause productions can be really needy <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and they need that quick response time. And sometimes, you know, we're, we're traveling or we're on, you know, we're on other assignments and, you know, being able to lean on you guys to help us with that is extremely important. The other important factor too is, um, it's uh, you guys can be the bad guys for us if we need to be the bad guys and hold people accountable to what they promise. You know, it it really helps to have have you, you with all that experience in that world um, versus us. Sure. And our team is great at pushing those buttons and asking for more yeah. and more and more and more. And we can't be <laughs> bad guys. And it's great. And, you know, we often have you included in email communications so that we can play off of each other a little bit in that way, which yeah. works out really well. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, productions will try to play to play to our, you know, because it's easy to get caught up in, in, you know, it's, oh, it's the movies or it's TV and it's this awesome show and it's this big actor, you know, and 
Um, you know, and, and they play to that, I think, sometimes just to try to, oh, you know, we don't need anything on contract. Let's just do it. You know, I'm not calling out a specific production by any means, but that kind of <laughs> stuff does happen. It happened in the past. Um, so having, again, having you guys where you can spot that kind of, you know, those kind of things. And, and, and again, like it's, it's the accountability thing. Like you really help, help these relationships, A, continue and B, you know, be accountable. Um, and, and you help us, you know, um, filter out some of the stuff that's not really worth our time either. Cause that happens too. Like right. you'll get, um, uh, you'll get stuff that, all right, you know, it's not really, the ROI just isn't there, you know, and no one's really going to see this piece of content or whatever it is. Cause again, we, I think we get, we get a lot of incoming requests. Um, and it's really sometimes hard to, to see those red flags, especially when you're just, you're just trying to get stuff done. Uh, sure. I'm glad we're needed. Yeah. That is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you get other brand managers in various FLIR divisions on board? I mean, they're doing their jobs, their intent on sales, their intent on whatever their core you know, day to day is. And when you tap them on the shoulder and say, Hey, I need you to actually help uh, stop everything and help create this dummy product for this TV mm -hmm. show like Ozark, right? How yeah. do you actually convince people? You know, is it difficult to sell on the opportunities um, when they're not that concerned about the entertainment efforts or how do you get them to see the value? I think, you know, it's funny because at, at the end result, everyone sees the value. So everyone's like, wow, that was such an amazing placement. How much, like I got probably, you know, hundreds of emails, I mean, maybe a hundred, maybe a hundred. I'll say a hundred. <laughs> uh, that could be hyperbole. I'm not going to, I am not going to actually count, but I got a ton of emails of people saying, wow, that was such an amazing placement. How much did that cost? You know, like all, like we had so many questions about it and it was funny because like, you know, everyone loves that end result. Everyone loves it. But getting there is challenging because we've got the everyday needs that we have. So I think it's different for every single um, product or uh, director of marketing for each vertical because um, they've, they've all got their goals, like you said. So really looking at the opportunity, I can tell, okay, you know, this one is going to be tough because um, they just like, it's, it's a bunch of products that we don't already have in our demo inventory. So, you know, we really, really have to, to up the value to get, to get folks on board, you know, cause um, that upfront cost of having to get, take that inventory out of stock, all that, that those are challenges. Um, so explaining to them like, look, you know, check this out. Here's look, look what happened. We did something similar like this with, with this group. Now these guys want this group and this is what the return is going to be. I really think it's worth it. Um, you know, and, and it tells the bigger Fleer brand story and it really like, like, so it's just kind of convincing people of, in that way. Um, but I think a lot at this point, you know, we've been doing it so long, I would say everyone's pretty much on board with most, um, and people are pretty accommodating and, and it's also presenting an alternative way, uh, alternative way, um, to, to talk about FLIR, um, in new and exciting ways, um, that are, that aren't the old, you know, it's not print media. It's not even like a cheesy commercial on at 2 AM. Like this is, this is a, very, very different than that. Um, and, uh, and I think the cost, you know, the cost of entry because our products are really desirable and high priced, high ticket items, we, we can negotiate for a lot more. And I think that's something that benefit, like that people see the benefit of. Um, but I think it, it took some time, but I, I would say people have really are, are a lot more open to, to moving mountains to, to make cool things happen. <laughs> And you typically work with them to try to get a set amount of inventory from each of the divisions that's participating with product placement, or is it more so that, you know, when we're coming to you or versus the inventory we have in, but when we're trying to add to it, yeah. is it still more than one off? It's, it's more, well, yeah, that's, it's, it's kind of tough for, for some of the product verticals, um, especially, um, you know, given, um, you know, we do have, we do have to sell products at the end of the day and we're not making, you know, these are, like I said earlier, not super high volume. So, um, I think we lean pretty hard on sales assets. So getting assets that are, are technically demos, right. Built to demo our product at trade shows and stuff, um, to take those out of that circulation and bring them, you know, have them stored down in your facility or, or as they come up, you know, pull them, 
and then get them back into circulation. Um, that's sort of how we've, we've, we've gotten around that. But there are some inventory, like uh, some of the cameras that are most commonly requested, like the T1K, I think, um, you know, Mythbusters and um, uh, Nat Geo and all, all these different groups that love that camera because of its portability and it's, it's HD um, and it's quiet and nice, you know, it's a nice package. Um, we've got inventory that we've purchased that, that is permanent and lives with, with our, as a, as a loaner camera. So those ones, I think we've, we've, we've allocated, but there, I'm always surprised, you know, like we had a, that request from uh, Chicago PD, I believe, you know, wanted one of our detection products. And that's one that, that we don't have in, in inventory for a demo because it had never come up before. So, uh, but we were able to get, um, get one. I think that one, we actually, we bought a special one just for, for that, that we, we now use as a, as a learning unit for that stuff. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of it comes up piecemeal, unfortunately, because it, again, it's convincing that marketing manager to, or marketing director to, to make that investment, um, into, into having that asset you know, for, for these specific purposes. Well, and productions are very savvy with Google and it's amazing sometimes with all the different companies that FLIR has bought over the years and um, different product lines that have been introduced, introduced that haven't been necessarily the mainstay of the product placement program, what they can actually find to ask for. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we've had, we've had people ask for, for really funny stuff um, that, you know, stuff that, uh, that is on our website, but is really for, and, you know, some of it is relevant, you know, it's for some of these military shows, but they, they'll ask for some really, really crazy, um, crazy cameras. And, um, and it's always, and those ones are always the hardest to, to get just because we don't, you know, the, the inventory is low and, and they're heavily regulated controlled cameras. So it's, it's, it really depends on where the camera's going, who needs it and when. Um, we haven't, uh, there's one, I'm hoping that we can find a good spot for it in, in some place, but, but the, the Black Hornet, like that's come up a couple times and that's a really cool little piece of technology that, um, I know we've had some requests out, uh, for, but we, we, uh, we haven't found a good spot specific for it. So, um, uh, now I'm just, uh, just rambling on about our cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now you guys have a lot of cool stuff and there'll definitely be a home for the Black Hornet. Uh, and a very has to be a very worthy production partner to get that. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's a cool product that's being used by the U.S. Army and um, Australian Army. It's really really high tech. It doesn't look, it looks like a little helicopter toy, but um, is much more sophisticated than that. Um, ever, like I think our biggest post we had we've had on social media um, this year was actually the the Black Hornet just simply taking off. Um, it's really funny. Yeah. Because. Uh, yeah, and, and it was a shot on iPhone. It wasn't even anything sophisticated, but it was our most liked post. Well, um, it looks, but, it looks yeah. like a toy. <laughs> That's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what are some of the challenges that come from product placement and FLIR technology? You've touched on you know, them a bit with sourcing potentially, but there are certain issues that our listeners have absolutely no idea about like export regulations and technical experience and using equipment. And we can't just send out cameras necessarily to a production without having mm -hmm. someone knowing how to use them to go with them or figuring out some massive, uh, let's just say hoops again to jump through with customs mm -hmm. export issues and things along those lines. Yeah, you know, a lot of our products are governed by ITAR regulation, um, which, you know, there's specific countries they can't travel to. If they do travel out of the country, um, there's very specific rules and regulations on where and who's handling them and how they're being used. So that always creates a challenge because sometimes, you know, these films or TV productions are trying to take the gear to, um, to really uh interesting places and you know sometimes those aren't places that our cameras can go so you know being able to make sure that we're in compliance with the law is, is one of the most it is the most important thing uh as far as we're concerned uh, for for that placement so um that that does create challenges you know and sometimes we've i think we've had had to provide maybe different products than what they've been asking or or even you know like some sort of workaround um where productions have actually you know filmed the scenes that they're going to be using those products in the U.S. rather than outside of the U.S. Yeah. So there's, there's little workarounds like that that we've come up with, but it is, it is a continuing challenge. And again, there's that education thing, um, not, 
you know, there's, there are a lot of people that just don't, don't understand why they can't just throw in a box next to all the GoPros and just ship it, you know, cause it just doesn't work that way, uh, for a lot of our gear. Um, and that's, you know, it's important, uh, to, to be legally compliant with, uh, with the rules and regulations. Yep. And then you also have the technical issues where some mm-hmm. of the science cameras and so forth really actually need someone who knows how to use them versus just saying to even a very experienced cameraman on set, go at it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, these cameras are not um, pick up and play. And I would argue that most movie cameras aren't, but our cameras are even more complicated because they're not really designed by people who usually think uh, they're going to be used on a movie set, right? They're designed for research and development uh, to be used uh, for very, very specific applications. So um, it can be a Frankenstein project uh, to figure out the best way to integrate it for different production. Like, um, and, it, and it was interesting in the Walk on Water production, um, the, the 30 Seconds to Mars performance, uh, the way that that was done, we worked. We actually worked with um, a, a partner of ours, M- Movie Therm, that helped build custom software. Uh, because one of the things that uh, the team wanted to achieve was they wanted to tweak the image and make sure it looked exactly the way that they envisioned. So what we actually had to do is we networked the cameras to a um, you know to a control room. We had actual camera operators, like you know, MTV approved guys that are using the regular cameras, have a little bit of time with the cameras and get you know rig them out and make them you know easy to use and ready to go for what they need to do on stage. And then we were in the back where there were four cameras, um, each one of us on a laptop, tweaking the image live. So there were a couple of temperature changes where Jared removed a mask, and if we didn't compensate for that change you know he was going to be blown out and it wasn't going to be what he wanted so uh, we had to do that stuff live Um, and then a funny anecdote like during rehearsal uh, because again these cameras aren't really used to be handheld um, one of the uh, camera guys accidentally hit the power button on the camera as he was trying to focus it Um, the whole thing went off and it was camera a so it was the main shot um, now the other problem is these cameras take five minutes to turn on because <laughs> so, uh, the, the camera has to come to temperature. So like, you know, that's terrifying <laughs> as a filmmaker, um, for a live event. So, um, you know, again, challenges and, and trying to, and we, we put a cap over that thing so it wouldn't be accidentally pressed. I mean, we figured it out, but, uh, and we're glad that happened in rehearsal and not during a live broadcast. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. It's been interesting, um, a science project every time. Well, these are the things that you learn so that the next time it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So with all of these, I mean, we've talked about TV shows like Ozark, we've talked about Rampage, we've talked about, uh, fe- you know, with feature films, we've talked about music videos. Which do you think is a bigger win? And where do you, where do you think... Uh, the best opportunities are from a brand side with TV, SVOD, feature film, or music videos? I mean, so, like, I, I, there's a couple of answers to this. Like, I think uh, it just depends on your viewpoint. And I think I, um, I, because, you know, my time at FLIR and my interest in technology, um, I'm always, always impressed by people who try to do unique things that have never been done before with thermal more than anything. And it, that has been more in the music video space, I would say than anything. Um, I mean, the first time I saw the camera on a steady cam was the walk, was the, um, was the music video, uh, the, my love music video. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was my, that blew my mind. You know, that was just so cool. And then, you know, the live performance for walk on water that also blew my mind. You know, these are cameras that, uh, typically aren't used that way. So that, I think just from a kind of cutting edge standpoint, I think the music videos, I think from a, from just an uh, awareness standpoint, um, like kind of helping that unaided awareness, um, the, the, the television, I'm sorry, the film stuff has been really good because um, I feel like we, we see a lot of chatter, you know, both from, from fans and non-fans, uh, people who aren't uh, actively engaged with our, with our gear, you know, talking about it on social media. And some of these these on demand video sh- um, uh, shows like on Netflix, um, that one was huge. But the Ozark one, I think, probably was the most 
most chatter I'd ever seen on any integration um, at all, uh, right. which is really, really, really cool. Um, well, Netflix is getting that too. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing so much more social engagement on Netflix, mm -hmm. and Amazon shows than you do even on TV right now. So it's interesting. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is very interesting. I mean, we, we definitely see like, you know, when it pops up on NCIS or one of those shows, like we, we see a list there too on social, but uh, for whatever reason, the, the net, and maybe it's just been you know, how good that placement was, you know, it's probably part of it. Um, that uh, is, is why we've seen that list on some of the Netflix stuff. Cause we all, I left off um, uh, the, the haunting of Hill House, like that was another good one. We got a bunch of tweets on, but nothing, nothing beats Ozark. Uh, right. placement, I would say. Well, I mean, for uh, the listeners who don't know, though, what listeners need to understand, you know, we've talked about all of these government usages and military usage and marine usage. What you don't know is a lot of people use FLIR for paranormal activity as well. So oh, yeah. We how, were, how can we leave that? I left, completely skirted over that. <laughs> so we Not on were, purpose. Right. Well, we work with so many finding the Yeti, finding Bigfoot, finding ghosts, finding mm -hmm. whatever it might be because FLIR can magically find all of that as the heat differential is uh, mm -hmm. spirits and apparitions stand out in a room. Right, Abache? Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I mean, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, I've confirmed it. We have. Uh, no, I mean, what I'll say about that, too, is, um, and the, the two the two things people uh, immediately associate any thermal imaging uh, for is the Predator film, you know, the, that original uh, movie that I would say really put Predator vision and thermal vision on, on like, the tip of, uh, you know, people's pop culture, you know, um, ton if you will um and then ghost hunting like those are the two predator vision and ghost hunting like that's what people people think of um when they see that the technology and fun fact that was us in 1987 uh in the original Arnold schwarzenegger predator film we had that that exact camp and product placement lasts through the years <laughs> Um, speaking of challenges, um, that, that was a challenge because the, the jungle was actually the same temperature as the actors. Um, so it actually made contrast really, really, really hard. So they had to do some funky stuff in post um, to, to make it look right. So it was heavily, heavily edited, but, um, but they did actually use, a, uh, it was an Inframetrics Thermovision, or Inframetrics 530 was that camera, um, not Thermovision. Uh, that was the actual camera, and we'll actually have that camera on display at at the C at CES. Um, so, if anyone wants to see it, it'll be there. Fantastic! That is this January in Las Vegas. <laughs> I don't know when this podcast is going out, so I apologize for doing no, it. <laughs> this this is releasing the week before, so we are all good. Oh, perfect! Oh, all right, yes. perfect, yes. perfect. <laughs> I so, plugged it. Perfect. Great plug. <laughs> So when do you think it's beneficial to allow a production contact to ask, because they do ask, uh, if they can keep a camera that's lent to them? And how do you go through deciding whether or not that is worth it? Besides, of course, the actual cost of the camera, since some could be a couple of hundred mm -hmm. dollars, some could be 20000 50000 150000 um, So yeah. quite significant. Yeah, I think I think probably the the stuff that the scripted stuff I feel like you know if they had non-working props like that would probably be okay. But just leaving them with inventory, um, I don't I, because you know the stuff is in high demand and we don't have a whole lot of it. And I, I I sort of shy away from that. But it's the folks like the MythBuster style like reality shows where they're if they have it they're gonna probably use it more. Uh, there'll be more opportunities that come up where they, because it's, it's planned, but not really, not as planned as a scripted show, right? Um, or, or I'd like to think, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, you know, and then content creators like, um, like YouTubers, um, that sort of thing, um, like people who have a big presence online that are doing behind the scenes stuff, that are doing, um, you know, content that's a lot more frequent, that is quick turnaround. Um, that, that's where it kind of makes sense. Um, I think to have to have that gear full time, um, and I think you know Safari Live, which is a great um, partner that we we found through you guys. Um, that, uh, um, 
we've given them a T1K and now we get this constant flow of really, really amazing imagery from them that they're pushing out and, and they're giving us to push out as well. That's been a really cool uh, placement opportunity for us. Yeah, well, that's cool. What's cool about them is not only is it all content being created into a TV show, but they're doing Facebook Lives, they're creating social posts, they're creating behind the scenes branded content. So it's a lot of content. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, it's great. That that's that. Those folks, you know, yeah. Uh, and you know, if I had my way, I'd give everyone a thermal camera. But uh, I don't always get. <laughs> you can be the FLIR thermal camera gifting Hollywood guru. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> well, one of the areas where you know product placement is kind of drifting into melding with um, is an area that you are taking lead on with. FLIR, which is with influencers as well. How are they impacting your marketing initiatives um, and content creation? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, like as pop culture shifts to, you know, to what's going on online with these YouTubers, it's really fascinating. Um, I, I heard from someone that their kid wanted to grow up to be a YouTube star. So it's like kind of crazy, you know, all these personalities are, are online, um, which is really fascinating. Um, like, that's who people aspire to be. Um, and they're making great stuff, right? Um, so what, what we've done is I think we've, we've seeded a lot of our kind of entry-level products, um, our Fleer One products specifically, to some of those YouTubers. And a lot of the science YouTubers, a lot of the, um, the educational YouTubers, um, like Physics Girl, um, Vsauce, Vsauce 3, um, Jake over there at Vsauce, and... Um, I'm trying to think as well. I mean, we gave Adam Savage a, a FLIR one mm -hmm. um, that was totally random. And what's interesting is, uh, you know, they, they tend, they make some content with the FLIR one, but then they always want, they always want something a little nicer, you know, obviously a little better. So we almost use the FLIR one as like an entry point mm -hmm. where they'll start to understand and grasp the concept of that. And then they figure out creatively how they can tell a story with it. And then we work with them to realize that story. Um, actually, Engineering Explained is another good example of that, another YouTuber. Um, and we keep it pretty organic. Um, you know, we don't, we don't want it to feel, like, I think in influencer marketing, there's a lot of just blatant placement um, that's like hashtag ad and that kind of stuff. And, and we haven't, we ha we've shied away from that. We've tried to keep it, keep the relationship mutually beneficial and just really um, more about giving the YouTubers an op, like a way to tell the story they want to tell um, without mucking it up with like, okay, we need you to say this. We need you to do that with like, so it's been interesting uh, because I feel like it's, it's, it's gotten us known in those circles um, both by their fans and by, um, um, by the other, other creators who use that stuff. Um, Cause our, our goal really is to just with all of this is to, raise awareness of the technology, make FLIR kind of a known name uh, when you associate it with thermal. Um, and, and yeah, so that, that's worked really well. And we've had some really great, uh, great pieces of content that we're also able to use on our social media channel um, that we've, we've pushed out um, as, as just regular old social content. So it's great. And then that stuff tends to have a longer shelf life too, because people find it down the road. Um, the gifs and little animations pop up on Reddit, places like Reddit and stuff that eventually make its way back to us. And you'll go on this discussion, you know, these discussion forums and you'll see these people talking about these things. And then someone goes, how'd they do this? And, and then inevitably someone will link to clear.com, which is kind of, you know, it's, it's a really long way there, but it, it, it's pretty cool. It, and it feels organic. It's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> exactly. So do you have any words of caution to a brand who's considering product placement who hasn't really gotten their feet wet yet? Um, <laughs> words of caution. I mean, I, I don't know if it's for, I don't know if it's for everyone. You know, I don't think every product, um, everyone needs to get there. But I think the important thing too is, is to have that, um, to have that buy-in, you know, to have, um, have, this internal support because this program does need support. You know, you need, you need to have the budget to be able to, to provide the, whatever you're providing. So if you, you know, you do it and you go crap, like cause all these opportunities are going to come up. And if you don't have, um, have that, whatever you're, you know, placing ready, um, that's going to be a challenge because 
you, you're just going to end up getting upset because you're going to miss a lot of opportunities. <laughs> and well, you don't want to do that. Those are great <laughs> words of advice to a brand who's considering product placement. <laughs> So how do you see product placement evolving over the years for FLIR? Do you, you know, over the last few years, I, I, as you talked about earlier, you know, we, there's surprise turns, you know, surprises around every turn, basically. Every corner, all of a sudden you have a new feature film taking it to a new level like Rampage or Sicario 2. Um, but where do you see the potential for product placement growth with FLIR? I think um, I think in you know now that we've gotten our feet wet and we kind of understand it, I think there's there's more opportunities for um, for more um, like rather than you know because we we sort of work in the pro, you know through through props through providing gear but we haven't really done anything um, bigger scale or like a bigger scale sponsorship that like that like actually. Um, formalizing relationships with some of these guys. I think we've, we've started to get our feet wet there mm -hmm. and I'm really excited because I, there's a lot of marketing uh, or specific marketing directors in our organization that are really excited about the opportunities that more uh, formal relationships um, can lead to or where that sure. they can go. Um, so I think that that is really exciting looking ahead. I think the YouTuber space is, is you know, it's ever evolving and it's um, it's a space that we've been playing pretty hard in, and we're going to continue to play hard in. And um, you know, it's it's sort of, that's sort of the unknown. Like who knows? It, again, people come up with new ways to use this stuff every day, and um, I'm I'm always uh, excited to hear the ways people want to use our stuff. So I think that's going to continue to be um, a growing space for us. Um, and and the technology, you know, the the technology is getting more accessible, um, the cameras that enable us to do, to film really exciting things are getting more accessible even to us. Um, so like that, that's gonna present ourselves with some really good opportunities as well. Very cool. And where do you think, we've kind of touched on it before, but where do you think the opportunities are to win big for other brands within this space? I think, you know, we've, we've had a lot of success connecting ourselves to other stories, you know, like the walk on water thing, the 30 seconds of Mars thing, that, that wasn't our story. I mean, that was, that, I mean, it, it became our story, but it wasn't, it was us aligning with, with the goals of, of another bigger brand or bigger, you know, bigger initiative. Um, and, and it became mutually beneficial. Um, so finding ways to attach your brand to things that really make sense, I think are, is really, really important because, you can sponsor things. You can sponsor anything you want if you want to pay for it. But if it does it actually make sense is where uh, it becomes more complicated. <laughs> um, you know, because they're like, you need to make sure that there's a story you can tell there. Because if there's no story, then, then why is anyone going to care? You know, and why does the placement even matter? And we also touched on this, but is there any other advice you'd give a brand who was considering launching a product placement program? Um, you know, I think, uh, don't, don't, don't do it yourself. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, go like going at it alone. There's, there's just a lot that, like people who people like call it branded that have a lot more experience in that space can really be the guiding light to, to make sure you don't spend your time on, um, on things that aren't going to have that return. Um, so I think that that is probably the, the other biggest piece of advice I can offer. Um, yeah. It's like, I paid you to say that. That's great. Thank you. No, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Listeners, I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> so we actually really like working with each other. Um, yeah. So, you know, Fachi, thank you so much. Really, really do want to, you know, let you know we appreciate your time and everything that you shared today with our listeners and with me and looking forward to the year ahead and some of the bigger partnerships that we have that are literally waiting to be revealed right around the corner and chatting with you and everyone at CES in just a couple of weeks and we'll go from there. Yeah, I think, um, actually, you know, I got one more piece of advice, um, okay. that I just thought of, you know, I think, um, it's easy to, uh, to say, okay, we're going to do like a million awesome things in here. And I feel like you really can count on like 
two or three really, really great moments in the year. And like, so don't like, cause there's a lot of small wins too. And it's important not to, not to overlook that stuff too. in, in this space, you know? So, um, I think it's easy for, for people to just look at those big ones and go, man, you know, I didn't land a big movie or I didn't land, you know, that kind of stuff, um, can stick. Um, and, uh, yeah, just looking at it all holistically is really, really important too. Um, in that, in terms of ROI. Um, and I think, yeah, a lot of brands, you know, we'll be talking to them and they'll be like, oh, well, I am holding out for that big movie. I am holding out for that big win. And the thing with Hollywood is you don't actually know when something little might actually overnight become really big. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I just want to, I wanted to reinforce that. I kind of alluded to that earlier, but I, I just wanted to close with that too. Um, yeah. No, and, and y'all, Fleer has done a phenomenal job working with, you know, the smaller filmmakers, the larger filmmakers, um, not really, you know, discrediting anyone along the way and being able to introduce and grow with some of those filmmakers, such as Ryan mm -hmm. you mentioned before, where, you know, you do very cool things at the beginning when someone's kind of eager and more independent and a little more edgy. And as they grow into more, you know, true Hollywood positions, uh, mind you, they'll bring you along and the relationships mm -hmm. there. And this is entirely yeah. a relationship business and not a money business. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, these, um, the, the stuff, especially with the YouTubers, like the stuff that we've done with them has gotten better and better. And it's, and it's because it's, you know, it's a relationship, you know, you, you grow with them, you support them and it can be a gamble. Like you never know what, what, like it, when someone's going to really break to becoming, you know, a, a huge star just based on the content they're creating. So working with them and, and taking that gamble is not necessarily a bad thing either. Um, so, yeah. And if nothing else, you get lots of content that you can repurpose for social media, even if yeah. it doesn't go very far otherwise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Vache, again, thank you so much for joining us today. And until next time, have a fantastic day. Thank you, you too.